Hello, this is the third in a series of recordings on analyzing experiments with one factor. And this corresponds to the experiments uh, with one factor uh, part two notes, which you should review uh, before watching this particular recording. So again, I'm going to go ahead and go to slideshow. Select a pointing device. And remember from our earlier discussion, I said something that's important in designing experiments is what we call the experimental unit, or EU. Again, it's nothing more than the smallest entity or quantity upon which you experimented. What's the smallest object? that you physically experimented on. That's the EU. Okay. And when we replicate, that is nothing more than applying the same treatment conditions to another experimental unit. So recall the meat packaging experiment where we applied uh, the same packaging method to three different stakes. So those three different stakes were replicates and those replicates measure experimental error. That is the variation among the experimental units that get the same treatment or replicates. Okay. And again, because we've held the experimental units <coughs> uh, or treatment conditions constant over the replicates, the variation in the responses for those replicate experimental units is noise. We can't explain it. We didn't change the experimental factors, but we're still seeing variation in the response. So many people today call it noise, but Fisher coined the term the experimental error. Okay. So experimental error is often thought of as the variation between replicate experimental units. Okay. But there's another type of random variation that occurs. Well, suppose I have my experimental unit, but instead of taking a single measurement, I take a series of measurements. For instance, what if I took that stake, and instead of measuring the log bacteria count in one location, I measured it in multiple locations. Well, statisticians often refer to this as subsampling. That is, within each experimental unit, I've taken a series of measurements. Similarly, if your experimental unit was a batch of some chemical you produced, and you took several samples or aliquots from that batch and measured them, the variation within the batch would be called subsampling. So for each batch or experimental unit, when we subsample, we take a set of, we'll use the letter M, samples. This is variation within the experimental unit. Okay. Well, we have a name for it. We often call it the observational unit, or OU. The observational unit is the smallest thing you measured. So if you think of the surface of the stake, the OU would be the smallest area upon which you measured log bacteria counts. Or for a batch of chemicals, it's actually the smallest uh, amount of chemical you use to make a single measurement. So the subsamples play in a couple of important roles. Okay. One of them, it lets us measure the variation within an experimental unit. In general, we typically will assume the experimental units are homogeneous. In other words, they're all the same, but that's not always true. As an example, if you look at the surface of that stake, who says that the growing conditions for bacteria are uniform across the surface? We don't know that. Or if you have a batch of chemicals, can we be certain that the physical characteristics of the chemistry are the same throughout the batch? We don't know. 
So when we take subsamples, they let us vary, uh, measure the variation or inhomogeneity within the experimental unit. Again, we call this subsampling. Okay. So we have two things in an experiment which give us two sources of noise. One, replication. That's the variation between replicate experimental units. And then subsampling error, which is the variation or lack of homogeneity within a EU. So if our experimental units are not homogeneous, there are some advantages to subsampling when it's possible. Not, it's not always possible to get more than one measurement. For instance, it could be a completely destructive test that you're doing. First, we get more precise estimates of the average response for each U. Why is that? Well, remember, if I have a set of uh, measurements on each EU, I can average them. And then the variation of the average would be the standard error, which is always smaller than the overall standard deviation of a single measurement. Two, and this is often important uh, in many areas of science and engineering, it allows us to estimate the observation error. That is the variation among the observations. We often are actually quite interested in measuring the lack of homogeneity in an experimental unit. And I'm going to show this uh, in a little while. So basically, when you're designing your experiment, and you always have some constraints on the total amount of resources, there's always a trade-off between the number of observations that you can take on each EU, or subsamples, and the total number of replicates. That is, how many replicate EUs can one have for the experiment? So as a basic rule, if most of the variation occurs is occurring within the experimental units, then we would want to take more measurements on each experimental unit to get a more precise estimate of the average for each um, replicate. But if the primary variation is between the experimental units, then we wouldn't do as many subsamples. We'd use more replicates because that's where most of the variation is occurring. Okay. So basically, I just wanted to go over these simple uh, linear models we've uh, shown you uh, previously and show how we slightly adapt them when we have to deal with subsampling and experimental error. So remember our basic model, okay, where the response, y sub ij, is a function of the overall mean uh, output of the system, plus a shift in the mean due to the factor level. So tau sub i is a potential mean shift due to the i factor level. And then the epsilon ij represents experimental error. That is the variation among replicate experimental units. Okay. Okay. And I also wanted to mention, while we're at it, how we calculate the confidence intervals for the treatment means. So remember that, first of all, y bar i, that's our way of saying this is the average for the i sample. The standard error uh, is just the square root of the mean square error. That's the sample variance divided by end. Okay. So remember. The mean square error is nothing but the sample variance for the response. Since we've taken um, a set of measurements, in other words, replicate EUs, let's say n replicates, the standard error of that mean okay, is the square root of s squared over n. Or by the way, in most software packages, you'll see that the square root of the mean square error is just the RMSE root mean square error. That's an old convention. So basically, the standard error is the standard deviation of the response s divided by the square root of n. Okay. 
And then, as you do in basic statistics, we use student's T to form a confidence interval, usually a 95% confidence interval. And you see these uh, estimated in the JUMP software. So you saw them earlier when we analyzed the meat packaging and the phosphor coating data. Okay. Well, what happens when we subsample? Well, now we've got two sources of noise. The variation between the experimental units and the variation within. So by convention, we often use this Greek letter eta as a measure of sampling error. So eta ijk is the error associated with the kth subsample in the jth replicate of the ith treatment level. You don't have to remember all of that, but that's its interpretation. Okay. So the epsilon is experimental error or variation between the EUs. Eta represents the variation within. So in the end, we now have two sources of noise that we need to consider, experimental error and subsampling error. Okay. And we can cal go ahead and calculate the standard error for the treatment mean in the same manner. But just notice we have to adjust the denominator because we now have a set of M measurements for each of the experimental units. Okay. okay. So at this point, we're going to discuss a case study in which we talk about uh, the analysis of an experiment in which there is subsampling and replication. And in this uh, case study, I think it will also show you why we're interested quite often in measuring subsampling variation or lack of homogeneity in an experimental unit. So in this case study, an engineer is studying three different electroplating processes to see if there are differences in average plated thickness between the processes. So for each process, the engineer selects six replicate coupons to be plated. Okay. So there are six replicates for each of the three processes or a total of 18 coupons. And then for each coupon, the engineer takes three random measurements of thickness on each coupon. So there are 54 total measurements. OK. The experimental unit is the coupon. The observational unit is the position on the coupon where you took the measurement. OK? So what we're going to now do is show how to do the analysis. Uh, and you have to be careful because subsampling is common in experiments, but the data are often not correctly analyzed. Remember, uh, the variation between the six coupons for each process is experimental error. The variation among the three uh, subsamples or observations for each coupon is observational error, and it measures lack of homogeneity. In this particular process, that subsampling error is very important. Although you want to maintain some average thickness, the uniformity of that plating thickness is also important. So if you have an average, and the average is acceptable, but what if in some places it's really thick, and in other places there may not even be any coating, so that it's not uniform. So in many ways, there is a real interest in understanding uh, the subsampling or observational error. The lack of homogeneity in an experimental unit is often of direct physical interest to the experimenter. Okay. So I'm just showing, I'm not going to uh, reproduce this for you and jump, 
uh, there is a platform called variability slash gauge chart and I show you where to navigate to it in jump so notice we have three types of variation first we have the average difference between the three processes okay then we have the variation between the coupons and then we have the variation among the subsamples for each coupon. And by the way, the standard deviation chart shows you the variation occurring within each of the coupons. So what we want to do is do an analysis that lets us see if there are significant differences between the three processes, allows us to estimate the experimental error, that's the variation between the six coupons and then in addition allows us to also estimate the variation within each coupon or the lack of homogeneity and we often call this sampling or subsampling variance. Okay. So basically I'm just showing you the reiterating the basic formulas on slide 12 for the mean square between and the mean square error in the F ratio. So we've already seen that. And I just want to point out on the next slide, when there is subsampling, we have to modify the mean square error formula. A again is the number of levels of the experimental factor and um, I meant M minus 1. It says N minus 1, but I actually want that to be an M minus 1, the number of subsamples per unit. That's important because if we do not make this adjustment, then we will not ca uh, actually calculate the correct F ratio. And generally, when you have subsampling, statistical software packages do not know how to do the correct analysis unless you give them some information and later I'm going to show how to do this in jump, how to get jump to give you the right analysis. Okay. So for our example that I just showed, there are two treatments. Okay, the degrees of freedom for error are fifteen. Okay. How do we get fifteen? Well, there are three processes, right? Within each process, there are six coupons. That's 18 coupons. And we take three measurements on each coupon. So if you go through and you do the calculations, you'll see the degrees of freedom are 15. Okay. So even though there are 54 measurements total, only 15 of those measurements are actually experimental error or replication error. The rest of them are actually subsampling error and we really need to keep the two levels straight. So how would we do the analysis? Well if you take a software package and you just try to do one-way ANOVA, here's an example of it in jump, notice it gets the degrees of freedom for experimental error wrong. It should be 15 but it's 51. Remember, it has no way of differentiating between replicate measurements and then subsampled measurements within each coupon. So it just assumes all the measurements for each coupon are replicates, but that's not true. So it's assuming there are 18 replicates for each coupon, but there really are only six uh, replicate coupons. So again, we have to be very careful. So because of this, the mean square error is not correct and neither is the F ratio. Well, how can we do the correct analysis? Well, it turns out one thing you could do is just take an average for each of the experimental units. So we'd take an average for each of the three measurements and then that would indeed give us the correct degrees of freedom. Now this is technically correct and it's the old way of doing it when people did it by hand, but 
we lose all information about subsampling. That is, by averaging, we lose all the information about the lack of homogeneity within each coupon. The second approach, which is the one we'll, we'll show how to use with jump, is based on what we call com variance components analysis. This is actually a large topic, but in design of experiments, our use of it is pretty simple. And we're going to show how to do that in a moment in the FIT model platform. Okay. And by the way, if you would like to see a simple way to take averages uh, for the subsamples in each experimental unit, in Jump, under the Tables menu, there's a platform called Summary where you can summarize the table in various ways. So here I've asked for the average thickness calculated by process and coupon. So for each of the 18 coupons, it takes the average of the three measurements and generates the table you see on slide 18. So what we would now do is just do ANOVA on the averages. So we could use fit y by x, mean thickness is the response, process is the factor x. We do the analysis, and there you have it. Again, this is technically correct. The downside is we lose all of the information about variation within the coupons. And having worked with a lot of people in electronics and microelectronics, Lack of homogeneity within each unit is often extremely important, and they want to measure it. Okay. So how do we measure it? Well, a better approach is to use the FIT model platform in JUMP. And in the FIT model platform, we can show JUMP or tell JUMP how to do the correct test and how to separate out the experimental error between coupons from the observational or sampling error within the coupons. Okay. So to do this analysis, I first want to make a quick diversion to talk about what are called fixed effects and random effects. These are two broad categories of the types of effects you could see in an experiment. Okay. A fixed effect is what we'll mostly concentrate on this semester. We say something's a fixed effect if, when you change the level of that factor, it changes the response a permanent and fixed amount. Okay, This is not random. It's fixed. So if I go from process A to process B, I shift the mean thickness some permanent amount. On the other hand, a random effect does not change the level of the response. So a random effect is simply a source of noise that we have incorporated into the experiment. Okay. So in our case, the coupons can be thought of as a random effect. In other words, the coupons, the 18 that were used, were just a random sample from some large population of coupons we had available. Okay. And differences between coupons are noise. So since the coupons themselves are just a random sample, the variation between, that we see between the coupons is noise. And we often call it experimental error. So in our experiment, we actually have two random effects. Experimental error, the random variation from coupon to coupon. And the second random effect is the variation within coupon, the sampling error. And what we're going to do next is show how to set this up in jump, so the jump can do the analysis. Okay. So again, we have two random effects in our experiment. The EU to EU, or coupon variation. Again, Fisher calls it experimental error. And then the random effect 
of the multiple observations taken on each U coupon. And together, both of these contribute noise to the observed thickness, but neither of them permanently change the level of the process. Only changing the process itself uh, will change the response some fixed amount. Okay. And just uh, some terminology, when we have statistical models that have both fixed and random effects, we tend to call them mixed models. Mixed models analysis, again, is a somewhat large esoteric area of statistics. But in design of experiments, it's relatively simple. And furthermore, the jump fit model platform is beautifully set up to help us actually do the analysis. So we're going to get fit model to estimate the random effect or variance component due to differences, uh, random differences in the coupons, and then estimate the random effect or variance component due to the uh, noise in the measurements taken on the, each of the set coupons, the three measurements. And then finally, Jump is also going to go ahead and see whether or not there is a fixed effect of the uh, electroplating process. So all three can be done. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to um, end this video and begin another video where I will walk you through the jump analysis.